Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, the podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Philip Danieri. Philip teaches built environment at the University of Michigan, and today we will speak about his debut book, The Appalachian Trail, a biography. Philip, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. So, Philip, uh, well, I would like to know a little bit about your background. What is it that you study? What's your specialty? And how is it that you became interested in the Appalachian Trail? Well, I, I teach uh, in two programs at the University of Michigan, the Urban and Regional Planning Program, which is, you know, buildings and land use and infrastructure, um, and in the program in the environment, which is how do we do those buildings and infrastructure in a way that, uh, you know, uh, works for the environment as well. And so... Um, and I, I've actually, this is about the third or fourth career that I've had. I was a journalist for a while. I worked in government for a while. But my research and interests have always been in trying to understand how places work, what we need in place to uh, make them work for people and how they got that way. And so in the beginning, my research was about big cities and metropolitan areas. And uh, I was very interested in how the whole of a metropolitan area, a metropolitan Detroit, a metropolitan Montreal, how is it run and planned? And that's called regionalism. Well, the interesting thing is that when you study regionalism, pretty soon you come across an individual named Benton Mackay, who was one of the big thinkers of regionalism and was also the creator of the Appalachian Trail. Um, so that was my first introduction to the trail and, and becoming interested in it. Um, and I was very intrigued by this notion that here's this person who was an important urban thinker, but at the same time was the creator of one of our foremost natural spaces. And how did that come to be and how did those thing, two things relate? Um, so that was the genesis of it. And, um, and, and the more I learned about how the Appalachian Trail is a, a built and human created space as much as it's a natural space, the more interested I got. And that's what I was trying to explore in the book. Okay, before we move to the book, can you tell us how much is, is there in uh, thinking of the environment in modern urban building? Uh, are new architects and city developers having this in their mind as they are crafting a new city or new building? Or is this something that comes as, a, as an afterthought? Well, I, I think a couple of things. At the level of the individual building um, or even one development of some kind, usually architects and developers are thinking about what works for them on that individual site. Um, now, a lot of them are interested in doing more ecologically sensitive things, and there are programs in place that provide incentives for them to think that way. So, uh, you know, at the level of the, of the individual parcel of land, um, the environment may or may not be central to, to, to people's thinking, but we definitely have a much greater appreciation now as planners and policymakers, as environmental thinkers about the fact that the urban and the natural very much overlap with one another. They are not completely separate spaces like they once were. We used to think here is the city and there is the countryside and they're completely different places. That was never really true. And in an age of climate change, when the carbon emissions of the built environment have so much to do with the integrity of, of the entire global life system, you know, we can no longer make those distinctions and separations. So definitely in my field of urban planning, in other fields like landscape architecture, uh, we're thinking about built systems and natural systems all at once. And we're making fewer and fewer distinctions about, you know, one or the other. It's almost always both at the same time. Right. And I have seen studies that uh, wealthier communities have more green space and more trees than less, uh, less wealthy communities. Uh, is there uh, an effort to make sure that every city have a little bit of a green space that people can enjoy and low, maybe lower the temperature? 
Yes. So uh, uh, folks in this field are doing a lot of work about the urban heat island effect, about when you get a summer heat wave in a city, which parts of the city are the hottest, which have their, you know, the biggest trees or the fewest trees. And um, you know, there's a huge effort in the U.S. by an organization called the Trust for Public Land to quantify the park assets in cities and towns and who has access to them. That's an organization that used to think of public land as being all about big open spaces and woods and fields and forests in far off locations. And they transformed themselves to take on this effort that public land and the benefits of you know, uh, more green spaces um, are, you know, are crucial in, ur in urban areas as well. So there really has been a revolution in thinking. Now, the thing is, our cities are very much the product of a historical legacy. So even when the thinking changes, and even when people become concerned with new things, we are very much stuck with the spaces that built up in the last half of the 20th century, and even before that. And so you, these things don't turn, you know, very quickly. Right. Okay, let's go into the topic of the book, The Appalachian Trail. Uh, can we, and it's a biography, of course, so can we go like right from the beginning, geologically speaking, how was this trail or how this huge body of mass created? The... the uh... The easiest way to think about it, and this is mostly accurate, but it's not very uh, scientifically delicate or, or, or precise, is that two continents collided with one another. Um, uh, what we, in fact, uh, it's, talking about the continents gets a little tricky because there used to be more or fewer. But what we now think of as North America and Central America and South America, everything on this side of the Atlantic, millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, Th that landmass collided with what is now Africa and Europe, and they crunched together. Um, and in the book, I compare it to a head-on car collision where the, the, the front hoods of two cars crumple up mm. when they crash into each other. So the, the, the scale of the time that's involved and, and the distances involved and the forces that are at work are kind of hard to wrap our heads around. But if you could look from a planetary scale and speed up the story very quickly, you would see these two land masses coming together and crumpling at their edges. And that's why on we have the, the Appalachian Range in North America that stretches all the way into Atlantic Canada. But you also have the counterpart mountain ranges uh, in Europe and stretching down to the Atlas Mountains in Africa. It's all one big geological formation in the sense that it's, it was all the same car crash. <laughs> and so you've got the mountains scrunched up on uh, the North American side of the Atlantic and the mountains scrunched up on the other side. And it's, it's all one thing. Right. Okay. So that happens millions of years ago. So, but now the trail was... I don't know, rediscovered, let's use that word, um, uh, but about 100 years ago when people became interested in it, can you tell us then now the beginning of that story that people sure. began to be interested in, in that trail? Yeah, and the key thing to understand is that the trail wasn't discovered or rediscovered, it was invented. There was no existing human pathway of any kind across the mountain ranges, and that's I think very interesting because not having known about the trail before I did this research, I imagined that it was like any other trail. There was a history of indigenous or native use uh, that then evolved into use by European settlers. And then we decided to build it into this. No, 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 no. Only a hundred years ago did this one person, Benton Mackay, say, wouldn't it be a cool thing uh, to tie together this mountain range with a trail that runs over the top of it? Now, there were some trails already in place, but those had only been built in the 10 or 20 or 30 years previously by people discovering the outdoors. This whole notion of exploring the outdoors and going for a hike for fun is less than 150 years old. So some of the earliest you know, sort of leisure excursions into these uh, mountainous places began to happen in the late 1800s. By the early 1900s, Mackay comes along and he says, we could build one trail 
it would run all the way from Maine to Georgia, and it would tie together this mountain realm, and it would really define the mountain realm as an alternative to the sprawling out you know, industrial cities down in the valleys. He got the process started. He was, as you can imagine, more of a thinker than a doer. And so he sort of put it out there. Other people came along, in particular, the lead builder of the Appalachian Trail, a man named Myron Avery. And it was in the 1920s and 30s that the volunteers went out in the woods and they marked a pathway and they chopped down trees to create the pathway and they made arrangements with landowners to have the land run over the mountaintops. So yeah, the whole thing is uh, this year, 100 years old. In fact, it was November of 1921, almost exactly 100 years ago, that Mackay's proposal was first published. And then it was 16 years later in 1937 that the last original link of the trail that connected the two endpoints was was cleared and opened up. Wow. Well, most of us are urban animals. And for I assume that for some of my listeners, they're having a hard time visualizing what exactly is a trail. So can you define what is a trail according to, I don't know, someone who has never seen one? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. You know, and believe it or not, it's one of those things that as soon as you try to define it, even something seemingly as simple as a trail, people will have debates over does this count or does that count? But um, certainly in the case of the Appalachian Trail, uh, it is a walkway that is meant to give people exposure to and the experience of uh, a more rustic, less built, more natural side of the world. Um, and I think that's the broadest definition you could give of a trail. Now, there are very successful urban trails. Um, there are some places called trails where you could ride a mountain bike on it, say, or even, you know, people take their four wheelers off into the woods and they talk about going for a trail ride in their, you know, Jeep with big fat tires on it. But in this context, a trail is a, a, a walking route through the natural world in, in some way. And in, in the case of the Appalachian Trail, it stretches nearly 2,200 miles uh, from the beginning point in North Georgia to the end point in Maine. There is one contiguous well-marked route that you never have to get off of that goes for nearly 2,200 miles. Um, and for the vast majority of that length, it's in the woods, it's in the mountains, it's off, you know, it's off track from the rest of the built world. Well, I assume this is uh, out of your uh, subject of expertise, but psychologically speaking, how important do you think is for a person who lives in this urban jungle to from time to time take us a walk in nature and you know hug a few trees and, and spend time listening to the birds and the flowers and all this and that there is plenty of evidence to indicate that just a little bit of exposure to a world outside of our screens and outside of our buildings um, is hugely valuable and it does not have to be an Appalachian Trail. It doesn't have to be a far off place. Um, even urban park spaces, uh, even a walk down a street where one, you know, tries to tune into the street trees and the birds that are there, you know, even stopping and observing urban pigeons for a little while just provides that little bit of distance from our day to day existence and the conversations that are running through our head. And it, you're right that it's not my area of expertise, but I work in a building and I'm a part of a faculty of people who spend entire careers understanding uh, the intersections between behavior and environment and the, and the psychology of being in the outdoors. And the science is very clear that it, it, you know, it, it has a, a big benefit. When you study a place like the Appalachian Trail, um, I frequently encounter people thinking that, well, that's somehow, you know, the truest, biggest, bestest outdoor experience, and therefore that's somehow real as compared to others. Nah, they've all got some nature in them, and they've all got some builtness in them, and I think wherever we can find these spaces and create them, we ought to take advantage of them. Well, this seemed like a huge endeavor to create this trail and to maintain it. Uh, do you know, first of all, how is it financed and who takes care of this trail? It took a while to work out this arrangement, but um, 
Today, the trail is a partnership between the National Park Service of the U.S. government and the private nonprofit Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And what the Park Service does is it owns a lot of the land that the trail runs through, and it coordinates the other government bodies that own the land that the trail runs through, the U.S. Forest Service, different state parks agencies. It's a real um, sort of mishmash uh, of, of land ownership that the trail runs through. But the key part of the equation is this Appalachian Trail Conservancy, which has a small professional staff that spends most of its time coordinating volunteer labor mm -hmm. to manage the trail. The trail was by and large built by and continues to be maintained by volunteers organized into local clubs. So when you talk about, you know, the budget or, you know, the means to do this, it's this big piece of park infrastructure. Blowdowns have to be cleared. Sometimes steps have to be built. Uh, the trail needs to be rerouted. Shelters need to be attended to. It's a lot of work. And it's done by people who feel like that's a fulfilling experience for themselves. And they join into volunteer groups and do it. Um, and that's really one of the things that makes the AT the AT, the fact that while it does have this professional leadership and it needed the protection of the Park Service to actually stay intact, nevertheless, the heart and soul of it is this volunteer effort that maintains it and keeps it open. Um, as I was checking out your book, uh, I mean, this is a huge endeavor to and a huge long biography of this trail, but you compose it of different stories of people who participated in this trail throughout the years. Can you give us more details on how is it that you structure the book? Yes, what I wanted to do was understand the trail as a place that people had built. And I wanted to understand why and how different people did that. So the way the book is structured is that each chapter is a sort of mini biography of one individual. And each of those individuals that I profile, a big part of their life was uh, doing something connected to either laying the groundwork for the trail or actually building the trail. So each chapter just reads as, you know, so-and-so was born on this date and died on this date and here's what happened in between because I want the reader to get a feel for who these people were, what their historical times were like, what their personalities were and why they found in the idea of this trail something that they connected to and, and wanted to invest themselves in. So I tell the book as these series of biographies, each part of the trail's history uh, gets told in one of those biographies. So the very first one is a profile of a Swiss American geographer who in the mid 1800s first mapped the Appalachian range and really in some ways gave it its name. Um, the name was around before that, but Arnold Guillot, once he created that map, um, that really solidified our understanding of it and, uh, and the naming of it. Um, so he's the first one. The very last one I profile is the author Bill Bryson, who almost at the end of the 20th century wrote a massively best-selling book about his time on the Appalachian Trail. Um, and so my hope is that what readers get out of it is that we can see the environment which the Appalachian Trail represents as a place that people create for themselves according to their own personalities and their own needs. And when you see all these different stories, people with wildly different backgrounds, they saw wildly different things in the outdoors. They had very different motivations for being engaged in it, but it was the, the knitting together and the combination of all those things that created the the actual physically tangible trail that we can now see and experience today well you talk about different people with different backgrounds but they are mostly white men that are, <laughs> are yep. participating in this can you talk about the demographic of the early uses of the trail and of course nowadays who are the main users yeah, the trail's use and, and the membership of the trail community in recent years has been diversifying greatly and quickly, um, and, and it, in no small part due to the intentional efforts that people like the Park Service and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy have taken to recognize 
the fact that, as you say, for most of the trail's history and for most of the North American environment, the creation and the production of those places was very much driven by the white middle class. The environment was seen as uh, both an amenity for people who had access to it. They could drive to it. They had the free time to experience this. They didn't have to work in the natural world to actually feed their family or, or anything else. So they could just see it as this place of escape. And so environmental thinkers and environmental history is very much tuning into and beginning to unearth the story of how this thing that we call environment and these places that we protect as quote unquote natural environments were very much shaped by the worldview and the wants and the needs of actually a pretty narrow slice mm -hmm. of the population. Um, so that's not just true of the AT, it's true of, of national parks in the US and Canada and the Western world in general. Um, and so what I say in the book is that if we want to understand where this trail came from, we need to recognize and acknowledge the fact that nature didn't create it, people did. Um, nature didn't only create it, people did. And not all people, <laughs> um, but you know, certain people. And that's uh, you know, an important part of, of the history, I think, to, to understand and have some perspective on. Well, this trail is, uh, is uh, you said, uh, 2,000 miles, 2,200, something yeah. like that. Yep. And it goes through from Georgia all the way to what is the main? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I imagine there are different plants, animals, uh, communities. Can you describe some of the fauna? What kind of animals, if I'm walking there, if I may stumble upon a bear or squirrel, what kind of animals may I see or what kind of trees may I see? Yeah, the, um, the range of flora and fauna that one might see is all over the map. Um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I couldn't even begin to list them off. Bird species, insect species, amphibians, uh, deer, yes, bears. Um, the, you know, bears live in mountainous environments and they, you know, um, they make their way in the world in those places. They, for the most part, are skittish of and stay away from people. But a huge problem is that with enough people on the trail, potentially leaving enough food around, the bears get trained to come into those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, most people's experience of the trail is not one of interactions with exotic wildlife. Um, in fact, in a lot of places, the trail isn't too far away from you know, a town or a highway nearby. We are talking about, you know, the eastern third of the North American continent, which is very built and developed. So while the trail is very rustic and it's through the woods, and there are some places like in Maine that it really is deep into a, a very wilderness-like uh, experience, you know, it, it's not uh, an excursion into the, you know, the you know deepest, darkest uh, forest. Um, so, um, but one of the cool things about it is that because it runs through so many different environments, through so many different latitudes, you can actually do interesting studies of the ecology and the natural science of the place because it, it cuts what's called a transect right across North America. So you can you know, start measuring certain things at different places along the trail and see the, you know, the, the changing in these various ecological components. Okay, and uh, can you tell us about your own experience about the trail? How do you do you do you uh, walk on it often or hardly ever? Or what's what's the story with you? Yeah, somewhere between often and hardly ever. Um, I've uh, I have walked on the trail in you know short sections of the trail in in each of the fourteen states that it passes through. Uh, one of the interesting things about working on the book is that the the archives that held the papers where I needed to do research were not surprisingly frequently in places nearby to the trail. So I could take a research trip and spend hours in the library and then spend hours going on day hikes. Um, and, and towards the end of the process, I actually took a trip where I drove the length of the trail and took a series of hikes along it. Um, but I am not a through hiker. I'm not even a long distance hiker that has spent nights on the trail. And um, 
one of the things that, you know, I try to convey to people is that the trail wasn't built for through hiking. In fact, when first pe- through hiking is taking a single trip that lasts months and hiking the whole thing and just sort of checking out from the world for four five, six, seven months and hiking the trail. I'm not one of those people. Um, but most of the people who use the trail are going for these short hikes and day hikes on it. They're at a state park and they say, oh, this is the Appalachian Trail. Let's go check it out. Or maybe they're out for a few days. So I try to make very clear to people, there are many hardcore backwoods hikers that have through hiked this and other trails and can tell you so much more about that life and that experience. Um, Where I think I've got something to add is as somebody who uses the trail and is interested in the trail in this other way, which actually represents far more people than the through hikers, um, you know, maybe I can bring this history of the building of environment to bear and understand it from this other perspective. But there's no doubt that if one wants to read a book about through hiking and about life in the backwoods, there are others to go to first. Um, But if one wants to understand how did these places come to be in the first place and how did people create them, that's the story that I was trying to tell. Okay, well, um, uh, about 25% of my audience are Canadians and another 5% are from somewhere else in the world. So assuming that one of them find this episode enticing enough that they would like to visit the Appalachian Trail, what would you recommend? Like go to this town and climb this little section of the mountain or, you know, like for a two day vacation trip, someone wanted to get away from COVID and (laughs) spend some time in nature. Uh, If they are in Eastern Canada, uh, the trail runs through Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine. um, And, uh, you know, it is not hard to get to the trail um, in, in any of those places. Uh, the White Mountains National Forest in New Hampshire would probably be you know, one place to go where there are a ton of trails, there's lots of facilities, there are places to stay if one isn't somebody who's going to tent in the backwoods. Those are pretty serious hikes. The main section of the AT is not as challenging Well, I have to be careful how I say this. The the steepest parts and the highest parts of the AT are in New Hampshire. The main section of the trail, though, is very rustic and separated from the rest of the world. The Vermont section of the trail, by and large, is a little bit more accessible to people with less experience. The the uh, if if you type AppalachianTrail.org into a web browser, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy has incredible amounts of information for different hikers with different interests, including a map that you can click on and see where the parking is and where one would have access. So um, that is the first place to go. Uh, for for people who like to travel the trail, how careful are people in regards to, you know, not throwing garbage and just taking care of the environment that they see? Are they are they crazy tourists who throw beer bottles on the uh, on the landscape, or it's, are more people, most people, careful about it? It's it's a good question. I think that from what I have heard from uh, Appalachian Trail maintainers and volunteers, the vast majority of people do pay a lot of attention to leaving no trace and following best practices. The problem is. Um, in some places, the volumes of people using the trail are so great that it doesn't take very money, very many people leaving bottles or trash behind to create a problem. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, we do have these volunteer maintainers that are trekking into the backwoods and hauling out bags of trash so that the trail is in pretty good shape by and large. The, the ethic and the community of the trail is one of stewardship by and large. But as I say, it doesn't take too many people not paying attention before you've got a problem. Well, Philip, I think you entice me enough. Next time I go to the States, I will will see if I can find my way into the trail. Uh, Can you tell us one last time the title of your book and where can people follow the work that you do? Uh, The title of the book is The Appalachian Trail, A Biography. Um, and there's a website about the book, atbiography.com, which uh, uh, has links to some resources, uh, many other books about the trail, the ATC website where folks can find out some more information about it. Phil, thank you so much for your time. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate uh, talking to you.